We have several areas of Grace and Truth Ministries, and uh, one in particular is the prison ministry. We've been sending tapes to oh, just several dozen prisoners, inmates in Tennessee prisons over the last year and a half. And one of our very dearest friends is Gary Mays out here at Riverbend Maximum Security Prison. Gary sent us a uh, he sent us a check this week, and you know that's a lot of sacrifice for those guys. This you may think this is not much, but they work all month long for quite a bit, for very little money. And he sent us ten dollars, and he said, Jim, I want you to challenge the people with this to give to the ministry. He said, I believe in that ministry. The, I, he said, I believe in grace and truth, and I, I want the people to give. And uh, so I'm just telling you what Gary said. He said, he said, if you really believe this, he tells me this every time he talks. He said, if you really believe in this ministry, give to it, give liberally to it, because we're sending tapes to these guys. And Gary's got a friend out there, his name is Don Eswick, and Don has been getting tapes from Gary, and he sent us a little short letter, and it's a very encouraging letter. And this is from Don out here at Riverbend Maximum Security Prison. Uh, Dear Jim, I have not had the pleasure of meeting you yet, but I have been blessed by listening to your teachings on tapes through Gary Mays here at Riverbend. I have had the pleasure of meeting Rich and was blessed by his teaching here the other night. Rich goes out there every Friday night for us. <coughs> I am in dire need of the truth. I need the in-depth teachings which your ministry professes. God is definitely shining his light through this ministry. I am just dropping a short letter to you to let you know that some of the seeds are rooting and growing, praise God, sincerely Don. And I, I, David, I'm, I gave you that though earlier, didn't I? Okay. And just remember Don, and uh, I got a letter from Virgil McKeg, but I'm going to save that and read that Sunday morning. And uh, I want to call your attention to something we've been talking about. Oh, I might remind you that those of you in Nashville, be sure and tune in every Tuesday night, 10 to 12. Those in, on, uh, every Tuesday night to the television telecast. And then every uh, Friday, or every Saturday in Nashville from 3 to 4 on Saturday afternoon. We're on five days a week in Clarksville, and Jennifer is our representative there. And uh, then we're on in some of the other cities, Fort Worth, Dallas, Atlanta, uh, Queens, or uh, we were supposed to be going on Brooklyn. We need to recontact them. Chicago, uh, Fort Wayne. Uh, we've been on Norman, Oklahoma. We've had a little problem there, but trust the Lord to work that out. Just be praying for the TV ministry. We've been we've been preaching every week for the last uh, oh two and a half years on agape or love. Now, love, the true love, is agape. And agape is not affection. Agape means to walk in the commandment, to walk in the commandment of a king. And uh, that's an old ancient word. And in that commandment, that commandment is the law of a kingdom. And of course, none of us have any ability to do that because there's none righteous, not one. There's none that understands the none that seeketh after God. And every man at his best state is altogether vanity. And the word best state is a Hebrew word that means erect or upright. Even when you're erect and upright and God makes you upright, you're not able to walk in righteousness. You can only walk in sin if God leaves it up to you. You have no righteousness or goodness in you or any ability in you to walk righteously and do right. That's what Paul said, how to perform in Romans 7 and 18, how to perform that which is good is not in me. I don't know how to do it. So God has to perform that in us, and he has prearranged it, and that is called predestination. Predestination is not fatalism. Predestination means that God has preordained and prearranged a law in our lives, a kingdom in our lives, and that's the law of the kingdom. We've said this, that agape, when the scripture says, love your neighbor, love your enemy, God is love, it never means phileo. Phileo, it never means phileo. Phileo is the word affection or to like somebody. And anytime the scripture says, God is love, love your neighbor, love your men, enemy, it means God is his righteousness or the light in his kingdom. 
I was showing this to everybody the other night. If I said God is love, if God is love, and we are to love our neighbor, there is an axiom. Oops, that's a T. What am I doing right now? All right. If you are to love your neighbor, I'll get it right in a minute. Uh, if you're to love your neighbor, and the word love down here is the word agape, agape, anywhere you find agape, anywhere else in the Bible, you can substitute equals for equals. Anywhere else you find agape in the Bible, whatever it is equal to, whatever love is equal to, or whatever agape is equal to, if love is equal to God, then we can substitute it down here where it says, love your neighbor. We can say God your neighbor because God is agape. God is agape, so we can just say God your neighbor. How do we God our neighbor? We give them, if God were a verb, and it is, because he says that love is, here is the way love was given us in the fourth chapter of 1 John. In this is love, that he said that Christ was given us from heaven to, that we might walk in his laws and in his commandments. That's how God, or love, was given us. To, so we God our neighbor. When the scripture says God is love, the verb form of that is A-G-A-P-E-O. Agapao. And therefore God is, it's like, God is a verb as well as a noun. The movement of God is his righteousness to us, and that is what he has predestined us to, is to his agape or to his boundary line, to his boundary line. And God has set up a boundary line. He set some stakes up on that boundary line. And in that boundary line, we're to walk in his law. We're to walk in his Law. Now, this, now, Mr. Kittle tells us that that word agape is an old ancient word that predated the New Testament back 2,000 years, somewhere way back in antiquity, and it was the relationship that a king had for his subjects and the subjects for the king, so that when, they, when he caused them to come into his kingdom, they would walk in that law in that kingdom, and they would not, they would not rebel against it, and it would be a law that was easy for the people to understand. Well, that's what predestination is. Let me give you a little bit something different on predestination. I'll, I'll give you this one more time. Of course, predestination means when the, when the sun shines, it shines on half of the earth. It, and that's the part that lights up the earth, and that is the part that is inside the horizon. And the horizon is, a, is actually just a, you'd have to call it nearly an invisible line because where darkness starts, light stops. Where light stops, darkness starts. And that's what the word predestinate means. It is the word pro, O-R-I-Z-O, pro orizo. And the word pro meaning before, and orizo is the word horizon. The word, the whole word pro orizo means to determine something beforehand. It actually means to determine boundary lines, and I'll show you why. Pro meaning before, 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 and horizo is the word, is the Greek word H-O-R-I-Z-O-N. Now, this word horizon comes from a word, ho-o-r-o-s, ho-oras. Now, the word oras, this actually means to bound to something or a boundary. That's what it means. Now the word ho'oras means the boundary. The word horizo, the word horizo comes from the word horas. And there's another word that comes from the word horas. It is the word heaven. Heaven. The word heaven is O-U-R-A-N-O-U-S. Horenas. Now, the word horenos, it means the heavens. Now, the Jews said there was a first heaven, a second heaven, a third heaven, a fourth heaven, a fifth heaven, a sixth heaven, and a seventh heaven. Now, as to whether there were all those, we don't know. We know that there are three that, are, that we consider the heavens. The heavens where God lives, and the heavens where that are above the earth, the, 
the uh, space, the, the stratosphere up there where the heavens are, the sun, the moon, and all of this. Let me read to you one more time about the heavens because I'm going to read this that I've got to you about the heavens. What the heavens does, the heavens dictates the law to us because when the Jews said the heavens, even when the old ancient peoples in the ancient world said heavens, what they meant was a, it was a higher authorities. The, the earth was divided into heaven and earth to the old ancient authorities. <coughs> the earth <coughs> were the plebeian people. When I say plebes, I mean, I don't mean a, an underclassman at West Point. I don't mean a first year student. But that's actually where they got that. When you're a first year student at West Point, they call you a plebe. That's because you're governed by all of the classes above you. Now the plebes in the ancient world, that is what the, that's what the common or the low class people were called in the Roman Empire. Let me read this to you one more time. This comes out of McClintus and Strong's Heaven and Earth. Now one day, there'll be a literal new earth, but what we're speaking of here is a, this was a common idiom back in that day and time, heaven and earth. Heaven and earth is an expression for the whole creation, Genesis 1-1. In prophetic language, the phrase often signifies the political state or condition of persons of different ranks in the world. And that's what you have at West Point. You have the upperclassmen, you have the plebes, the first year, the first year guys that go there. The plebes have to, they have to stand at attention. I went to Texas A&M and I had to, I was in, it was a compulsory course school back in 1957. You'd have to hit a brace every time an upperclassman came by and you'd have to, uh, uh, if he asked you questions, you'd have to answer what we call campusology and you'd have to be able to say, I don't know. Instead of saying, I don't know, if uh, an upperclassman asked you a question, you'd say, sir, being not, in, uh, not informed to the highest degree of accuracy, I hesitate to articulate for fear that I may deviate from the due course of rectitude and sorcery. I'm a very dumb fish and do not know, sir. See, I remember that. Yeah, I said it about 5,000 times. And you can remember that. If somebody asked you what time it was, you'd say, uh, let me see if I can remember this. Uh, I hesitate to articulate. Well, I can't remember it. I'll, I'll remember it later. But uh, I'd, uh, I'd say, uh, let me see, can I remember that? Uh, seven, six, eight, talk, nine vibrations past the hour or something. I can't remember it anyway. The hidden, the hidden inner work is the mechanism of the micrometer, not as direct accordance with the celestial forces by which all two times government, sir, I can safely state that it's seven, six, eight, talk, nine vibrations past the hour of 1700, sir. You had to say that when you were a, a plebe, and everybody governed you. And that's what they do at West Point. Everyone governed you, and you were plebe. Well, that's what the heavens did. They governed the plebes, and the plebeians were called the earth people, and the plebes were the common class, and they had no authority. Well, the heavens is what governs heaven and earth. In prophetic language, this phrase often signifies the political state or condition of persons of different ranks in this world. The heaven of the political world is the sovereignty thereof, whose host and stars are the powers that rule, namely kings, princes, counselors, and magistrates. The earth is the peasantry, plebeians, or common race of men, who's, who possess no power but are ruled by superiors. Of such a heaven and earth, we may understand mention to be made in Haggai 2 and 6, 7 and 21 and 22, and referred to in Hebrews 12 and 26. Such modes of speaking were used in Oriental poetry and philosophy, which made a heaven and earth in everything that is a superior and inferior in every part of nature. And we learn from the Ammonites, quoted by me, that the Arabians in his time, when great calamity, when, when uh, they would express that a man was fallen into some great calamity, said his heaven had fallen to the earth, meaning his superiority or prosperity is much diminished to look for new heavens and a new earth in 2 Peter 3 and 13 may mean to look for a new order of the present world. And that's why in Isaiah 65, the Lord said, there will be new heavens and new earth and I will reject Israel and you and I will begin to rule in the heavens 
or the horos and the word heaven, this word uranus, and of course we get the word uranus, the 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 uh, uh, star out in the skies, or one of our planets, Uranus comes from this word, and that word Uranus comes from this very word, Ho-Oras, and that also, the word Horizo comes from the word Ho-Oras. Well, the heavens is what rules in the kingdom of God's light. So the word heaven is directly related to the word Predestinate. Let me read to you something that I got out of my... And I'm, I'm going to try to continue some on the spiritual Sabbath tonight, but I want to give you some of this. I may get back to my spiritual Sabbath. I'm going to try to. I may just mix some of this up. Let me read this. And I got this out of my McClinics and Strongs. Heaven. We're actually in the heaven right now. We're in the heaven right now. And we will be in heaven with Christ, and he will rule us in eternity. I don't know which heaven we will exist or abide in. We're in his law. That's what we're in right now. And he rules in us, and we rule as kings because he is in us. And when we open our mouth, his word comes out of us. And that's how we rule with a scepter of righteousness. Remember the word scepter of righteousness over there in Hebrews 1 and 8? The word righteousness is E-U-T-H. E-T-E-S, and that's the same word over there as straight in the baptism. Notice how baptism is related to the word heaven, related to the word predestinate, because you rule with a rod of righteousness, and that word euthetes is the word straight, and the baptism is prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight, and that is, that's the word euthetes, and it is E-U, and T-I-T-H-E-M-I, -E and that word tithemi means to level in a passive, horizontal posture, and what that means, that means to bow down, level oneself to the heavens, to the light, to the kingdom of God's light, that were predestinated, prohorizo, oras, and that word oras is the word mountain, mountain. And of course, it comes from the word A-I-R-O, and that word A-I-R-O, I'm sure we get the word A-R-R-O-W. That means to lift up in the air. And the mountain, a mountain was a capital city of an empire, and it ruled by a law in that empire. God's mountain in this empire is always called Jerusalem or Mount Zion. And what is it in Mount Zion? God's law rules in our life. Zion is the mountain where Jerusalem sits. In Zion is God's temple, his tabernacle. His temple is in Zion. We are Mount Zion, over there in Hebrews 12 and 22, the heavenly Jerusalem, the church of the firstborn, and we live in the heavens, in the kingdom of God, because we have been predestined for the mountain of God, for Jerusalem, and that is to be in God's Jerusalem or God's kingdom. God's law is ruling us, and that's what we're... Notice how we, you can't get away. All these things connect. Everything. The word heaven, Uranus, is related to the word mountain. That's related. And you remember Jesus said, if you'll say to this mountain, be thou removed, Peter, be thou cast into the sea. Peter was arguing with Jesus because to kill a perfectly good, good fruit tree, but the fruit tree had leaves, and it wasn't fig See, uh, The time of figs was not yet, and the figs came on before leaf season. Time of figs meant fig harvest. The figs should have been on the tree, and so Jesus cursed the fig tree. They had to pick the buds off for the first four years. By the fifth year, if it didn't bear fruit, every fruit tree had to be cut down, even though the 20th chapter of Deuteronomy said that you couldn't kill any fruit trees. You had to kill them on the fifth year or after that if they weren't bearing fruit. And Peter said, Behold the tree you cursed! And Jesus said, if you'll say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast in the sea. And he was talking about the Babylonian mountain, Babylon, what's called a mountain of pride, a mountain of self. It was built upon, let us make us a name. And Peter was arguing with Jesus about killing fruit trees. And Jesus said, you need to remove the mountain of Babylon and live according to my mountain. That is the heavens. That is my mountain, Jerusalem. Live in my light. That's what you've been predestined unto. Bow to the will of God and be at ease with it. See, Peter didn't want, Peter was like the rest of us. He liked arguing with God. Let me read some of this about mountains. And I, this came out of my McClinics and Strongs. And I hope you can understand, all of this is related. 
Because arguing makes you shine. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? It really does. And if you have your own mountain. Hold on a second. Let me get a drink of water here. All right. And have y'all noticed we constantly continue to go into new territory on predestination? And the word ho-oras, ho is just the masculine article, definite article. It's the masculine ho-oras. It's God's mountain. That's what it is. God's mountain is his boundary line, and predestinate means to predetermine a boundary line or a mountain or a heaven. That's all it is. Now, let me read this. Ancient Hebrews, for lack of the term cosmos, how's that? <laughs> for the lack of the term cosmos or cosmos, and mundus of Greeks and Latins use the phrase heaven and earth, Genesis 1, 1, Jeremiah 23, 24, Acts 17, 24, heaven and earth equals... Uh, the world and all the things therein to indicate the universe. Wettstein, in a, in a learned note on 2 Corinthians 12 and 2, and Eisenmenger state the rabbinical opinion as asserting seven heavens. This number arises confessedly from the mystic value of the numeral seven. According to Rabbi Abiah, there were six antechambers, as it were, or steps to the seventh heaven, which was the uh, Timanon the very presence, presence chamber of the divine king himself. In the last of these passages, the prophet Zephaniah is mentioned after some apocryphal tradition to have been caught up into the fifth heaven, the dwelling place of the angels in a glory sevenfold greater than the brightness of the sun. In the rabbinical point of view, the superb throne of King Solomon with the six steps leading up to it was a symbol of the highest heaven with the throne of the eternal above the six inferior heavens in 1 Kings 10, 18 through 20. These gradations of the celestial regions are probably meant in Amos 9 and 6, where, however, the entire creation is beautifully described by the stories or the steps of the heaven for the, Im the imperial heaven, the troop or globular aggregate, the terraformer of the earth and the waters of the sea, including the atmosphere, which the waters are poured out upon the face of the earth, uh, are poured out upon the face of the earth, and then, we, then I've got some other things on the heavens. Now, what God has done, God has predetermined heavens in our life so that we might rule with this rod of iron, that we might bow to the will of God, and that's what rules men when we are in the light, that intimidates men when we walk out in public and we start bowing to the will of God. Now, God is doing all of this for our good. That's why we know all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And in order to get us to walk in the heavens or in God's light, God's boundary line, since there's none good and there's none that understands and no one seeks after God then what we must do, we must bow to the will of God. Now, he's, now, the Lord says he has predestinated us and predetermined that we will conform to the image of Christ, and that's exactly what we're going to do. He has pre predetermined that we will, with, that we will bow to his will. Y'all excuse me a moment. I'm looking for something here. He has predetermined that we will bow to his will and, bow, and be conformed and to be like Christ. Now, here's what we're predestined to. You say, Jim, you preach on this constantly. Yep, because it's everything that righteousness is about. Everything. And when we preach on unrighteousness, we have to come to the understanding that everything that's unrighteous is, is the exact opposite of predestination. Let me erase this here. We're predestined unto something. And what you and I need to do is bow because what God is working in our lives he is conforming us by bringing all kinds of fiery trial. I was talking to Tommy Hampton last night, and he's going through a lot of severe trials. He's one of our listeners and watchers on television down in Nashville. <coughs> he's going through some severe ordeals. And I talked to him for about an hour and a half, two hours. And Tommy said, well, I should sure appreciate you, you calling me. He said, this has really helped me. And I quoted to him from over there in Hebrews 12 where the Lord said, he said, uh, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord for whom the Lord loveth. He chastens and scourges. I said, now, Tommy, what he does, he scourges. That word scourges, the word mastix, M-A-S-T-I-X. It comes from the word M-A-S, T-I-G-O-O, mastigao. And that means the Roman flagellum, the Roman whip. That's what it means. And the word Roman flagellum, 
was a whip. It was a it was a long it was a whip, and it had leather thongs. When it had not, when it had uh, nine leather thongs, there would be pieces of glass and bone tied up all through there. It'd be real sharp edges on the bone, on the glass, and they'd get the sharpest, and they'd just file them out till they could cut into a man's back. When a man is scourged, and when God said, well, I scourge my children, it's because you don't have any ability to live the way you're supposed to be living and live in my heavens and rule with my rod of iron or rule with my scepter of righteousness. The only way you can do that is to get involved in my spiritual Sabbath, rest in what I'm doing in your life. And that, those whips would have all these pieces of glass and bone. They'd be little thick pieces of glass and they'd have point, points on them. And that was called a cat of nine tails because it was like a cat's claw. And when it would come down, it was a lion could do very little more or some big cat could do very little more than what this cat of nine tails. It was called a cat's oh, nine tails. And it was a, it was a, the predecessor to that was the scorpion. The scorpion. Now, now you remember when Rehoboam uh, took some bad advice from some of his teenage friends and they said, you tell these, these, uh, these old men here in Israel that your father, that your, your little finger will be thicker than your father's loins and he chastised them with whips. A whip had, did not have these, this glass and bone in it. He said, you tell them that you're going to chastise them with scorpions. And a scorpion was called a scourge. And of course, a scourge, another name for scourge is sickness. Now, God will use sickness. Mark Capers brought something to my mind the other day. Let me see if I can find that. Uh, he brought something to my mind. God will use sickness. He'll use anything he has to do to get mine and your attention. In eleventh, in uh, the uh, the eleventh chapter, it was eleven or twelve. Hold on a sec. Of uh, First Kings. Hold on. Mike, uh, uh, Mark Capers gave me this. No, it wasn't Mark Capers. It was uh, it was Reginald Mitchell gave me this, and he was talking about over here in the book of Micah. With, oh yeah, here it is. Look at this in verse six. We we did a message a while back. Chapter six in verse. 13, chapter 6, and then Reginald Mitchell, the pastor, my dear brother up there in Peoria, Illinois, and uh, people say, God don't make sick. Well, that's what it says right here. And sickness was considered a scourge or a severe sickness or disease when a, when a whole nation would become covered with it. And he says in verse 13 of chapter 6 of Micah, therefore also will I make thee sick in smiting thee. What? Micah 6 and 13. We did, a, uh, we did a message a while back, does God make sick? You bet. Uh, I mean, he killed David's baby. Uh, he killed the children of Job. Job said, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And the scripture says concerning that verse, and all this Job said not nor charge God foolishly. He says here in verse 13 of chapter 6, and Reginald was pointing this out to me the other day, Therefore also will I make thee sick in smiting thee, and making thee desolate, because of thy sins. People say, God don't make sick. Well, tell Micah that. Huh? Tell him that. Thank you, Reginald, for pointing it out to us. That's good, isn't it? He said, I make sick in a, in a, in a, uh, when it was a, when it was a uh, pestilence and everyone had it and you had a, a big surge of sickness. It was called a scourge. And God says he scourges. That cat of nine tails was called a scourge. And scorpions, he's going to bring scorpions upon our lives. And scorpions are evil teachers. Comes from the word scorpizo. Scorpizo. The word scorpizo means to scatter abroad. He, and Jesus said that the hireling Let's the wolf come in and scatter the flock because the sheep don't belong to him. That's what hirelings do. And they preach smooth, soft, easy words over there in uh, Micah, the third chapter. Micah, the third chapter, the 11th verse, the heads thereof judge for reward, the priests thereof divine for hire, and the prophets thereof divine for money, divine 
is the word kosam, and it means to distribute fortunes. Same word as deamon, demon. Distributes fortunes for money. Kosam means to speak smooth words. Q-E-C-E-M. Q-E-C-E-M. Now, when the world is listening to smooth words, the world is listening to smooth words today. The charismatic movement is speaking the devil's doctrine. In the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Deamons, that means to distribute fortunes, has the same meaning of kosam. What is it, Mary? Okay, let's read 11 and 12. Okay. All right, 11 and 12, Micah 6. Now, the reason he makes us sick he scourges us to get our attention because he wants us to live in the heavens ruling with a rod of righteousness or with a scepter of righteousness. Now let's read that 11. Huh? Start at one. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's back up here a little ways. Let's don't read all of it. God, I got a lot of, well, here are you mountains in verse 2. Mountains meant what? Meant authorities. Israel's mountains, Shechem and Jerusalem had forsaken God and had gone the way of Babylon, the mountain of this world, the mountain of pride and self, and he says, well, let's read, let's back up to one. Hear you now what the Lord saith, Arise, contend thou before the mountains, and let the hills hear thy voice. Since we're talking about mountains. And, and Israel was, was composed of two kingdoms, two mountains ruled Israel, Shechem, which was in northern Israel, and that was the mount of Mount Ephraim, who ruled northern Israel, and the southern kingdom, which was uh, Judah, was ruled by Jerusalem. Hear you, O mountains, the Lord's controversy, and ye strong foundations of the earth, for the Lord has controversy with his people. And he will plead with Israel, O oh my people, what have I done unto thee? And wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt and redeemed thee out of the house of, of servants. And I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, consulted and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him from Shechem until Gilgal, that ye may know the righteousness of the Lord. And where does the law of righteousness of the Lord come from? It comes from his holy mountain, Jerusalem. Wherewith should I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? You remember Isaiah said, I will away with your sacrifices. The sacrifices were shadows so you could obey me, but you give sacrifice all week long, and you go and you worship, you sell all of your goods on the Sabbath, or what we call Saturday, and then he said, you serve Baal all week. And he said, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He hath showed me, how about that? Wait a minute. The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. He's talking about the way they burnt their children and offered them to Moloch and they ate them. We talked about how that they committed cannibalism or the Christ mass last Sunday night. He has showed thee, O man, what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. The Lord's voice cries unto the city and the man of wisdom. Micah is saying that God is crying out to the men who can hear because Israel is serving idol gods. And you shall see thy name, hear ye the rod, who hath appointed it. <coughs> Are they yet the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked? And the scant measure that is abominable? Shall I count them pure with the wicked balances and with the bag of deceitful measures? No. He said, you got to weigh out right. You've got, to have, you've got to have works that are worthy because works of repentance. For the rich men thereof are full of violence, and the inhabitants thereof have spoken lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. He's talking about God's people Israel. They've served other gods. Therefore, will I, therefore also will I make thee sick in smiting thee and making thee desolate because of thy sins. Thou shalt, not, thou shalt eat. But not be satisfied, thy casting down shall be in the midst of thee, and thou shalt take hold, but shalt not deliver. That which thou deliverest will I give up to the sword. Thou shalt sow, but thou shalt not reap. Thou shalt tread the olives, but thou shalt not anoint thee with oil. And he's saying, you're going to go out and plant. And you remember Haggai? He said, you'll go out and gather, and your bucket's going to have a hole in it, like Hank Williams said. He said, you'll have a bag that's full of holes, and you're not going to be able to gather a crop. 
And he said, I'll blow up on it. When he said, you'll gather very little. And he said, I'll bring famine, and that's the first judgment of God. And sweet wine, but shall not drink wine, for the statues of Amai are kept, and all the works of the house of Ahab. What did he do? He brought the mass down into Israel. They worshipped Hercules, Baal, <coughs> and the groves are Hercules and Venus. And you walk in their councils. In whose councils? The councils of Ahab, not in the mountain of the councils of God's law in his mountain that he's preordained and predestined you to, and he's going to bring sickness upon you. People say, God don't make sick. The Charismatics are preaching the most hellacious doctrine in the world. They are Roman Catholic. And the Catholics have taken over the world. And by the end of time, they're doing it. And Catholicism is not just something that calls itself Roman Catholicism. When Constantine started the Roman Catholic Church and built it upon an edict of toleration, said, we will tolerate sin, we will tolerate one another and get along. <coughs> yes. We are not non-denominational here. <coughs> we believe truth. Non-denominational means any, it believes any denomination, any belief can come in and we'll accept it. We will not accept anything except the Word of God here. And you walk in their councils that I should make thee a desolation. God said, when you walk in councils of the idolatrous gods, I'll desolate you. And the inhabitants thereof and hissing, therefore ye shall bear the reproach of my people. Now the reason God has predestined us is to sumorphose us. Let me write this down. I got off on a totally different message than I started off with, and I'm going to continue this, and we're going to finish this. Now, he said he'd scourge us. That scourge, that cat of nine tails, that was a Roman scourge. In fact, in fact, when he says he scourges every son he receives, now the Jews had a scourge. The Jews' scourge, would they'd put you flat down on the floor, they'd drape you across something or lean you on something. they scourge you with a rod, and that's what... And that's what he said he scourged Israel with, the rod. It was a long stick. And you could get 39 licks of that. Now, that kid that went over there to Singapore, and he got caned three to four times, he better be glad he wasn't in Israel because you got 39 licks as hard as a man could wield it. Man, your back was just nothing but a bloody pulp. I don't know which was worse, the Jewish scourge or the Roman scourge. When the Roman scourge down, came down, that cat of nine tails would rip the hide out, take all the meat off of the back, and expose, it would expose sometimes the spinal cord. You could see the spots of whited uh, bones sticking out. Sometimes they said it would clean the shoulder blades clean, and you could see a man's shoulder blades. The scourge, when Jesus took that cross on his back, they could see that white bone sticking out on his back. And, and when God said in Hebrews 12, he said he scourges all of his children, he used the word mastigao, which was the Roman scourge. He said, I beat you like the Romans beat their prisoners and their enemies, those who are being put to death. The average man, the average man could not take the scourge and the cross. Many men died under the Roman scourge. God said, my children, I beat them within an inch of their lives. And the word chasten does not mean, it means to chastise, or the word chastise it certainly means to instruct. Our word instruct does not connote the word chastise in the Scripture. The word chastise in the Scripture means you're walking one direction and God grabs you and makes you turn around and go the other direction. That is not something you do easily because you keep trying to turn away from Him and that's the word repent, isn't it? To turn from self to God. It's like, yeah, uh, and He makes you turn and look at Him and say, I have preordained you. You will follow me. And we, yes, Lord, yes. And after a while, we turn around, we start going our own way. He, he hits us in the back with that scourge and it rips all the hide out. Now, he's put me in the hospital. God's near to kill me. I'm not going to argue with a charismatic. You're ignorant if you believe, don't believe God. Cut people to the ground for their arrogance and for your arrogance. If he doesn't cut you down here, he'll catch you in hell. I'm not, gonna, I'm not even going to discuss that with them. They're ignorant very stupid, brutish. <coughs> brutish means to have the understanding of an animal. They can't hear. And that's what pistis is. Uh, yes. Same thing. That's right. Pistis. Yes, it means to turn from self and turn to God and look to God and hear God. And when you hear, you hear with understanding and you do what he says. Now, here's what he's conformed us to. And I really need to help us to understand this because we all need to get a hold of this. Look at this. 
He has predestined us to conform. For whom he did foreknow. Foreknow is the word prognosco. It comes from the word prognoi, P-R-O-G-N-O-I. Prognoi. Prognoi means forefather. It doesn't mean to know about God predestined you because you he knows you're good enough to turn to him one day. He said, none seeks after me. Nobody. Prognoi, foreknow, he foreknows us. He foreknows us because he foreparented us. And that word proganoi means parent or forefather. He has foreparented us or forefather. It does not mean he knew you would come one day, therefore he predestined you. That is not what that means. I'm talking to the camera up there. You know y'all know that. Yeah, I'm yelling. Go ahead. How would y'all like to be up there? Be behind that camera and point it like that. He thinks I he thinks I'm mad at him all the time. That's probably why he's repenting so much, you know. Uh, all right, now. That means everybody. Huh? What? <coughs> what? Well, we're gonna we're gonna show you something about that in a minute. All right. All right. <coughs> For whom he did foreknow, whom he foreparented whom he was a forefather beforehand. I put four no again. Forefather. Forefather. He was our forefather. Of, the word father is the word ab in the Hebrew, and it means to decide or desire. He has decided who his children will be. He has begotten us of his own will beget. Yes, he became our father because he preordained it. Whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, prohorned, rizzo, predetermined for something in particular. It don't mean that he's predestined you to walk in the gate of heaven, sit down, and you don't know how you got there. He's predestined you to something specifically <coughs> to conform. That's what he's predestined, you to, predestined us to. Over there in Philippians 3.10, look here. Here it is. Now, what, here's what he's predestined us unto. Philippians 3 and 10. Look at this. Whew. Philippians 3.10. All right. Being made... Well, let's back up to, yeah. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship, the koinonia, the fellowship to share with him. The fellowship of his suffering, that means to be with him in suffering. You remember Paul said in the second chapter of Galatians, I am crucified daily with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. And he said, now look here, he says, being made, being made conformable unto his death. Now look over here and, Fli and look at Philippians 3, 21. Quoting from the previous verse, speaking of the, the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be Fashioned, same word, conform. Same word to conform. Being fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. That the word fashioned, the word conformable up here, and this word conform, that he has predestined us to conform to the image of Christ are all the same word. Huh? Sumorphos. S-U-M-M-O-R-P-H-O-S. Now, we're, we're being made conformable unto his death. Now, why did Jesus die? What made him die? It's what he said. Yeah, it's what he said he would do. And didn't he do it? It wasn't his will. He said, I laid down my life for the sheep. And even though he laid his life down for the sheep over in Acts 4, chapter 26 and 27, 28 verses, he said all the kings gathered together that day, and they <coughs> gathered together, <coughs> both Herod, Herod gathered that day, he gathered together to do his evil will, he did his sin, he committed murder, and he did for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined and predestinated to be done. The conforming was Christ laying his life down, and men did their will that brought it about. The evil was ordained of God as well as the good because he said, I make light and darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all things. So everyone, Jesus was going to do his will, and God the Father was going to cause those evil men, Herod, Pilate, the Jews, and the Gentiles. The Jews would say, 
crucify him, and the Roman soldier would pierce his side, and the Roman soldier would nail the nails in his hand, and it was all the will of God. Everyone was conforming to the will of Christ. And the Gentiles and the Jews were committing murder, and Pilate was saying, I find no fault in, in him, pronouncing the words of the priest over there in the temple as they inspected the lamb for four days, and they'd thumb through it and say, I find no fault in the lamb, and Pilate was doing his evil deeds, and Herod was doing his evil deeds. They were both committing murder, and the Jews and the Romans were committing murder, and they were doing the will of God. That's the method by which he laid his life down. And when you and I do the will of God, Men will bring on, scor scorpions will come, and Ezekiel said, God said to Ezekiel, he said, Ezekiel, you dwell in Babylon among scorpions, be not afraid of their words. Their words won't affect us. Their stings will have no effect upon us over there in Revelation, the ninth chapter. The stings of the scorpions is that scourge that comes down on our back. It's evil men, evil teachers, saying evil, easy, smooth words, and we won't be affected because we will bow down to the will of God. We'll level before Him. Now, here's what He's predestined us to. To conform, that word sumorphos means to be jointly formed, similar or fashioned like unto. And what was the likeness of Christ? He said, I came not to do my own will, but will of Him that sent me, and he bowed to the will of God freely, and it mattered not what went on in his life. Do you think Jesus sat around worrying about whether he was going to be able to pay his bills? No. Did Jesus worry about whether he was uh, going to get cancer? Or did Jesus worry about how he was going to be able to live if his wife or his husband left? Or what, did he worry about whether he was going to be able to buy a donkey and make the payment on it or not? Did he worry about anything? No. He said, I came to, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And he worried about nothing. Even Jesus didn't do his own human will. No, he didn't. His own human will was against the will. That's right. That's why he said, not my will, but thine will. Yes, sir. And not worrying is part of what Jesus did. Jesus entered a daily Sabbath with the Lord. Jesus did the will of the Father, not... M-E-R-I-M-N-A-O. He did not bear him not O, and that meant to take thought. Take is not in the text over there in Matthew 6. Take therefore no thought for your life. Actually, the word thought, thought is the word. Now, look, look at this and watch. Meros, it's the word meros. Meros is a word that means to eat or a piece to eat of. If you go up here, if I bring a a piece of bread to you and I break it in two and I hand you the piece of bread the piece of bread the word piece is meros it's the word meros now he Jesus took no thought for his life the word thought is the word mero merimnao <coughs> and it comes from this word meros means this is not your portion in life to eat of merimnao means not to worry not to worry the word mero, I'm not, oh, comes from the word meros. The worry is not your portion. Jesus worried about nothing. He wasn't concerned whether his enemies would crucify him or not because he knew they were going to do it, and he bowed to it. So you have to be con not to be concerned when your enemies start crucifying you. This word mero, I'm not, oh, take thought, comes from that word meros. It means a portion to eat of. Your portion is not worry or being concerned for this life. Bow to God's will. People say, I don't know what the will of God is for me. You know what they mean by that? I don't know if God wants me to go out and become a, a great famous gospel singer. People can applaud me. Or if I need to be a great evangelist. Or if I need to be a well-known worldwide uh, great uh, philosopher for God. Or whether I need to go to Africa and be touted by the news uh, media of the world to be another uh, 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 Mother Teresa. Be an account manager. Yeah. Or to be what you do, you bow right now to what you can do, and God will take care of the rest. You bow to the will of God, and while you're at it, you pump some gas. You bow to the will of God, and while you're at it, you decorate cakes. And you bow to the will of God, and while you're at it, you sell cars. You bow to the will of God, and you work in a company up here. You bow to the will of God, and while you're at it, you be an account manager. Occupy.
first thing in your life is to bow to the will of God. That's what Jesus did. Paul was an itinerant preacher. He preached the gospel, and while he was at it, he made some tents. But he didn't do that. His living wasn't making tents. His living was for God. Whatever you do in word, he'd do all to the glory of God. What God wants us to do is bow to his will. And Mary got some good news today that she didn't have cancer or one of her tests. The main thing we need to do is not be concerned if we do or if we don't. It's still the will of God. That's the whole point, whatever it is. But even with that, it would be good news. <laughs> yes, and in, the, and in the flesh, we feel good about it. We feel good in the flesh, but the hardest thing to do is when that happens is to be thankful that you do have it. It's easy to be thankful you don't have it, but it's to say, oh God, I know you have something for me now. And that's what it's about. Now, sumorphos comes from soon. Sumorphos, soon. That word soon means with, but it means more than just with. It means to be in fellowship are walking with Christ, and what is our fellowship in? It is in His suffering. So, soon, suffering. Okay, we're fellowshipping in His suffering soon, and morphos actually is the word morphe. It means to form the idea of adjusting or shaping. Here it is, M-O-R-P-H-E, M-O-R-P-H-E. It means to be shaped or fashioned, fashioned. Now, here's what we're predestined to. We're fashioned, we're being shaped by what? By all of the works, the scourge. God turns evil men on us as scorpions. They whip us. David said, deliver me from the wicked, which is thy sword and your right hand, God. He brought the Assyrians brought the Babylonians against Israel, and then he turned around and called them scorpions. And said, don't be afraid of the scorpions' words, Ezekiel. What he's predestined for our life is the mountain of God, his will and his laws. There's not a good thing in us. And Mikey, if he's got to break your <coughs> back and make you a quadriplegic to get your attention, that's what he will do. But that's in his program and his plan because he's allowed you to have that stubborn of a heart. If that's what he has to do, if he has to crush you through three or four or five divorces, he has to get your attention through a bankruptcy and just break your health to nothing, that's what he'll do. And once he does it, I have been one of the most proud, worrying persons you've ever seen in your life. And after God put me on my face at about 45 years old and said, now stop that. Where I can't move, I'm going, oh, okay, <coughs> okay, God. <coughs> and he'll kill your kids. He'll take your wife. He'll take your husband. He'll do whatever he has to do to get your attention. People say, God wouldn't do that. He did Job, didn't he? Huh? He sure did. People say, let's look at this one more time. I've got to show you this. He's predestined to conform. Let's go over here to the book of Job. I'm going to show you something. Job could not be at ease. Job could not be at ease. Let me show you this. Back to the book of Job. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. All right. Job, the second chapter. First chapter. First chapter, Job's the richest man at east. He's got seven sons and three daughters. A great substance. 7,000 camels in verse 3. Uh, 7,000 sheep in verse 3, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she asses, a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. And Satan comes to him and says, no wonder he serves you. Look at the hedge you built about him. God says, okay, take everything he's got. Leave his life alone. You can't touch him. You can't touch his body. So Satan begins to move upon him, and the sons and the daughters are eating the oldest brother's house, and the messengers came and unto Job and said the oxen were plowing and the asses feeding there in verse 13. The Zabians fell upon them and the servants were slain with the edge of the sword and I only am escaped to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking there came also another said the fire of God is fallen from heaven, not the fire of Satan. Satan is God's devil, he's God's servant. And he's burns up your sheep and your servants and consumed them. But what this is called is the scourge. He's beating Job half to death because Job is still 
He needs the battle of the will of God. Now, Job, let me tell you why we're going through this. Job did not rest in this. Job had just as hard a time as the rest of us in resting in this. Job had a real difficult time. He could not, he had the hardest, most difficult time being at rest. Now, I'm going to show you that in a minute. The fire of God has fallen from heaven, hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only alone have uh, escaped to tell thee. And then he says in verse 17, the Chaldeans made out three beds and fell upon the camels. They slain the servants with the, four, the sword, and I'm the only one left to, to tell you. And his sons and his daughters were eating in their house and at the elder's brother's house, and there was a great wind that came and out of the wilderness, and the four corners of the house fell upon the young men, and they were all dead. And Job arose and rent his mantle, shaved his head and worshipped and fell on the ground and worshipped God. But he didn't feel good in himself. Sometimes it don't feel good, but we need to bow to it. Job was bowing, but he wasn't resting. Now, you can bow to the will of God and not be at ease about it, huh? Because that was a custom. That was a custom. See, uh, they weren't supposed to put a razor upon their head as Jews. And he shaved his head as though he... Everything was a waste. And they would sit down in sackcloth and ashes, and they would start ripping their clothes. And that was a sign that you were in mourning because a child had died. And he said, Naked came out of my mother's womb, and next shall I turn, return. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The word name is the word Shem, and it means authority. God's authority. He said, God's commandment has done this. He said, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. He didn't say Satan took away. I always love verse 22. In all this, Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. Job, God said, Job did not charge me with something I didn't do. I did this. Job said, God did this. Bless me, his authority, his commandment that did it. God said, you're right. You didn't charge me foolishly. Everyone listen to Job. This is the scourge that I whipped my children with. Job had a hard time with it. Satan comes back and he says, skin for skin, yeah, all that a man will, all that a man hath, he'll give for his life. He wants to save his own skin. And Satan says, let me touch his body and then he'll curse you. Will God let him bring boils on his body from the head of his, top of his head to the sole of his feet? And he took him a potsherd and scraped himself with all, and he sat down in ashes. In verse 9, then said his wife unto him, Dost thou retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Curse God, not curse Satan. Curse God. God this did to you. And Job said, Well, certainly he did. And he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? Shall we not receive evil? Job said. He said that in a positive manner, we receive evil woman and then I always like that very last sentence of verse 10 it always you ought to draw a line over that in verse 22 of verse 1 and all this did not Job sin with his lips God said I sent all this evil killed his seven sons and three daughters I devastated his family and let me tell you something Job bowed to the will of God but he wasn't at rest about it there's a difference in bowing to God's will and really coming to a place of being at ease when these things begin to happen let me show you Micah, this past week, brought something to my attention I'm going to address. I appreciate him for calling this to my attention. Some people say, you people in predestination, you believe that babies go to hell. Babies do not go to hell. Let me show you what Job said they went. Probably that babies go to hell is one of the, the biggest resentments of predestination. Predestination does not mean that babies go to hell. Now, I'm going to preach on this here in these next couple of weeks. I'm just going to show you this. Job was not at ease about what was happening, but he accepted the will of God. Now, when you can really come to a place of being in a Sabbath about this, that's when it's easier to handle. You might accept the will of God, but being at ease about it is another thing. Would you could lay down on your bed and have pneumonia and say, this is the will of God, let me get the rest that I can. Look here, let's go down here, let's read a little further. Chapter 3, verse 1, now, I'm going to be addressing babies do not go to hell when they die. And I'm going to get into the context of of all have sinned, I'm going to go to the context of there's one way to heaven, but, I have, but, I, but I'm not going to do that tonight. There is no doubt babies do not go to hell. All babies that die before they come to an accountable age go to heaven when they die. That's what Job says in this next chapter. 
and I'm going to be addressing the entire scope of this in the next couple of weeks. After this opened Job his mouth and cursed his day, and Job spake and said, Let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night in which it was said there is a man child conceived. Let that day be darkness, let not God regard it from above, neither let the light shine upon it. Let darkness and the shadow of death stain it, let us cloud dwell upon it, let the blackness of the day terrify it. Why is he saying this? Because he is so, so unhappy, even though he's bowing to the will of God, isn't he? He's not at ease about this. He feels bad. As for that night, let the darkness seize upon it. Let it not be joined unto the days of the year. Let it not come unto the number of the months. Lo, let that night be solitary. Let no joyful voice come therein. Let them curse it that curse the day who are ready to raise up their morning. Let the stars of the twilight thereof be dark. Let it look for light, but have none. Neither let it see the dawning of the day because it shut not up the doors of my mother's womb. It had been better if I had not been born to have this misery nor hid sorrow from mine eyes. And he said, if my mother's womb could not be shut up from me being born, why died I not from the womb? Now, if, if babies die and go to hell, Job is not saying, I sure wish I'd have died from the womb so I could have gone to hell and really been miserable. Now, he wasn't saying that, was he? Uh-uh. He wasn't saying, look what he says. Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? Why did I not uh, die so I could go to hell and be in my misery? No! He was wanting rest. He was wanting to be comforted. Look at the next verse. Why did the knees prevent me, or why the breast that I should give suck? Why, did, why didn't this not happen? He said, if I'd have died when I was coming out of my mother's womb, he tells us where he would be in the next verse. For now, if I had have died when I came out of my mother's womb, now should I have lain still. That word lain still means to lie down, to sleep. And the word sleep, when a believer was in death, the word sleep, the rabbis said, was applied to the believer that died a believer or died going into the arms of the Lord. And when Jesus said, Lazarus sleepeth, he didn't mean his body was asleep. And they couldn't perceive what he said. And he said, well, let me clear this up. Lazarus is dead. Then he said... Then I would have been quiet, and that word quiet means to rest and settle down to a repose. I do not believe babies go to hell, because Job said, if I'd have died from my mother's womb, I should have slept. Then had I been at rest. New walk. In you. W-A-C-H. Now that word new walk is equivalent to Sabbath. Let me show you why, okay? I'll show you. Let me, let me read the rest of this. He said, Then should I have been at rest, and I would have been with kings and counselors of the earth, which built desolate places for themselves. He said, I would have been with some of the believing kings who have gone to be with God, or with princes that had gold or filled their houses with silver. He said, I would have been as comfortable as a king or a prince. That's what he's saying. Isn't that what he's saying? He said, or as an hidden, untimely birth, I had not been as infants which never saw light. There the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary be at rest. And the word rest is the same word as the word rest in verse 13. Job said, if I had died from my mother's womb as a baby, I would be in a Sabbath. Newark, rest. We are, and I need to go into this later, but babies are called innocents. The slaughter of Herod was called the slaughter of the innocents. The same as the slaughter in Israel, I mean in Egypt, that was the slaughter of the innocents. He said, I, the weary, 
will be at rest. And the word weary is the word yagia. It means tired, one who's tall and exhausted. And that's, he said, if I'd have died from my mother's womb, I'd have been at rest. I would have been in the Sabbath. Well, let me show you he's saying he would have been in the Sabbath. Look over here in Exodus 23. Look at Exodus 2. Now, I didn't mean to address this, but I'm going to address this. I appreciate Micah for bringing this to my attention, but I, this needs to be brought out, that babies don't go to hell, huh? Chapter 3, verse 18. Chapter 3, what? Chapter 3, verse 18. Okay. There the prisoners rest together. Yeah, that's good. They hear not the voice of the oppressor. The prisoners, that was, that's the, those who were the spirits in prison. Pris, prisoners... The word prison is the word philake. It means the division of day and night or light and darkness. And the word forgiveness means to pardon and release from prison. Those who have been pardoned and released, those who have been forgiven, will be at rest. And they'll not hear the voice of the oppressor. Now Job's not saying, I sure wish I'd have died when I was young so I could be in a real misery, be in hell screaming for the mercy of God. It's not what he's saying. Huh? Well, let's look over here first, Mary. Go to Job. I want to show you what Job is saying. You see the word rest in verse 13, the word rest in verse 17. He said, if I'd have died from my mother's womb, I would have been in a spiritual Sabbath. Look over here in verse 6, chapter, chapter 23 of Exodus, verse 12. Verse 12. Six days shalt thou do thy work, and on the seventh day thou shalt rest... That word is Shabbat, it's the word Sabbath, or you'll be a repose, you'll be at repose, or you'll desist, or you'll keep the Sabbath. And he says, thy, that thine ox and thine ass may nuak. The Sabbath was so that the slaves, and that's the same word as nuak, when Job said, if I'd have died from my mother's womb, I would have been in the Sabbath. And the Sabbath was equated with heaven going to be with God or I would be at rest in the boundary of God or in his mountain wherever he is or his light, I'll bow to his will and I'll quit arguing with him and I'll quit being weary. Now babies are innocent until they come to an age where they know right from wrong and they know sin. Here at Grace and Truth Ministries, I do not and will not preach that babies go to hell. And I want people to understand that out there. What we're predestined to is the boundary of God, not that babies go to hell. If, you, if babies die before they come to understand unto him that knoweth to do good, doeth it not to him and to sin. The word knoweth is the word ido. It means to be able to recognize good and I don't need to go into this any far, farther, but babies do not recognize what's good and evil. And they have to come to a place where they know that. I've been, mean, I needed to preach on this for a long time. And, uh, they, they not only don't know the difference, but when they do know the difference, they really don't know the extent of, of, of the whole thing. Yes, that's it's right. A big babies are spiritually alive, and they have to die spiritually. And you and I have been owned from birth, and God protects us when we're in that sinful state. But let's go back over here. So, wait a minute. He says, and the son of thy handmaid and the stranger may be refreshed. And that is the word, not false, the word refreshed. And it means to be breathed upon. And God breathes upon us and gives us rest, or he gives us comfort by the comforter. And, that's, and if you'll notice, the word rest there, and one of the main purposes of the Sabbath was so the animals might, might rest. And over in the book of Proverbs, Solomon said that the, that the honorable man takes care of his beasts of burden. And the Jews said that uh, the, the honor of a man was shown by how he treated his animals. Now, I love animals. Don't nobody mistreat my animals. And if I see somebody mistreating an animal, especially these preachers who mistreat the sheep of the flock, that angers me. Let's go back over here to Job. This Now, I'm going to address all of this. I'm going to come back and cover this, too, because that's something that is, I don't know if y'all know that, but that's the big argument about between the <coughs> predestinationists and, the, and those who believe uh, in free will. They say, well, y'all are predestination people. Y'all believe that babies go to hell. No, we do not preach that here at Grace and Truth because babies don't go to hell. Job did not wish 
He could go to hell, did he? No. He said, if I had died from my mother's womb, I would have been the spiritual Sabbath. You remember David? I'll say this. David said, you remember he, him and Bathsheba had their affair. David had a, had a, had a baby. And Bathsheba had a baby. And David, and God said, I'll strike the boy sick because of your sin. Or he had Nathan, tell, the prophet, telling that. And David said, and David began to pray and weep and cry over the baby as he was sick. And as soon as he died, David said, well, it's time to clean up and forget it. He's at rest with God. He said, I cannot go to him. Uh, he said, I, he cannot come to, come to me, but I shall go to him. Now, David didn't, wasn't saying, I'm going to go to heaven one day. I'm going to take a side trip to hell to see my baby before I get there. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, I shall go to him. Babies do not die and go to hell, huh? Adam and Eve were born alive. They were born alive. They were in their innocence, and so are babies. And I need to stop here because I, I could stay on this. I got just a ton of, of information on this. We're going to come to this. And we, I've been needing to preach on this a long time because I guess y'all do know. Do y'all understand that the big argument uh, between the free willers and the predestination is most of the free willers say we believe babies go to hell. First of all, we're not predestined for that. We're predestined to be in the mountain of God under his law, his will, and to rest in these things. And Job had a real hard time resting in the things of God. But let's read, the re let's read on down here a little ways. Verse 19, the small and the great are there. The servant is free from his master. Wherefore is light given to him that is in misery? He's talking about resting. And what you and I need to do when we know that we're under the scourge of God as Job was, we need to relax in this as well as accept the will of God. Now, accepting the will of God is the first step towards this. But rest. That's, they used to tell us that in military school. We'd be hitting a brace, and they'd say, rest. That means, okay, you can at least hit a parade rest. And when they said rest, he'd say, okay, you can stop. But well, let me tell you, rest in Christ, in the Lord, because all of this is of him. Now, let's continue here. Wherefore is light given to him that is in misery and life unto the bitter and soul, which long for death? Why would a man long for death? Not because he knows he's going to hell. A lot of times I long for this to be over with. Do y'all? Huh? When you're under persecution, if you're living high, wide, and handsome with the devil's doctrine like the charismatic doctrine is doing, you don't want to die. You got your new Cadillac. You got your new town car. You got your Mercedes. You got your Corvette. You got your big new, uh, big new Colonial. Your big new Williamsburg. And you're going to, going to go to Europe. And you're going to go to Hawaii. And you're going to take a vacation out somewhere on the Riviera. You don't want to die. You're not under persecution. The scripture says that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. God whips us and causes us to be willing to say his truth and then men start crucifying us. Where is your tribulation? Where is your trials? If you don't long for death somewhere along the way, I kind of doubt. If you don't want to be out from under this thing, I doubt seriously the person has any salvation if they don't ever want to be out from under this trial and say, Lord, and I'm not saying when you're young and long before you go through a lot of trials, what really makes you want to go to find death is you've been under this kind of scourge that Job was under. Job said, Job, actually, do you know the only thing that Job, God had to, God had to deal with about Job? Job was one of the most righteous men there were. And the only reason he dealt with Job is Job thought he was a pretty good guy and thought he had it together. Job said, I am innocent. Whew. Look over here in, in Job 33. Elihu is talking to Job. Hold your place there in Job, Job 3. And this is Elihu, the young preacher, talking to Job. And he says, look here in verse, let's look here in verse, uh, let's start in the, uh, verse 4. The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. If thou canst answer me, set thy words in order before me, 
Stand up, behold, I am according to thy wish in God's stead. I also am formed out of the clay. Behold, my terror shall not make thee afraid, neither shall my hand be heavy upon thee. Surely thou hast spoken in mine hearing, and I have heard the voice of thy word saying, I am clean. You see, when you get to thinking, you've got it together. I am clean without transgression. I am innocent. Job wasn't killing and murdering and stealing and lying. He thought he was a good Christian. Oh, me. When a man thinks he stands, let him take heed lest he fall. And the word stand is the word H-I-S-T-E-M-I over there in the 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians. When a man thinks he's crucifying, histame, the word histame is the same word as sta, or to stand upright, and it means to crucify the flesh because the word sta, or which the word histame comes from, also comes from the word s-t-a-u-r-o-s, s-t-a-u-r-o-s, and that word staros is the word cross. The man who thinks he's standing and being upright, that's what Job thought. And God killed seven of his sons and three of his daughters and destroyed all of his substance <coughs> because he thought he was a good Christian. <clears throat> he was a good man, a wonderful man of God. But he said, I'm innocent. Neither is there any iniquity in me. You better watch out when you think you're getting together. The more I learn, the more God whips me, the more I know there is to learn about what I've already learned. And I know I don't really understand everything I've already learned. If I thought I'd already understood the eyes of the Lord, when I was a young preacher, I used to go in and preach that message I'd preach on the second born, and I wanted to show off. I'd go in in front of a bunch of preachers when I was 27 years old. I'd get in there and tell them about the first born being uh, rejected and the second born being blessed and, and uh, that Abel was second born and Jim was second born, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were second born, Ephraim was second born. I'd just go through all that, and I'd impress everybody. And you know what I did when I did that? I quit learning on that subject. And when you think you know everything on a subject, watch out, you're falling. See, I don't believe I really understand everything on histamine and faith and death to self and homo legat or confessing and predestinate. You notice how we get in there, all these new things on predestinate. If you think you're learning, if you think you've got it on one subject, watch out. You hadn't even learned what you think you know. Let's look here. Here's where he said, I am innocent. Let's read on down. Behold, he findeth occasion against me. He counteth me for his enemy. He putteth my feet in the stocks. He marketh all my paths. Behold, in this thou art not just. I will answer thee that God is greater than man. Verse 13. Job, here is the answer concerning your innocence and my innocence. Why dost thou strive against him? For he giveth not account of any of his matters. Yeah, why are you striving with what's happening in your life? Why are you wrestling over him killing your seven sons and three daughters? You gave him glory, but you're not at rest and you're not at ease about it. Now here's the thing. Job told, Job said, blessed be the name of the Lord, the Lord hath done this. And God said, you're right, and all this you didn't say in your lips. His wife said, curse God and die. He said, we receive evil from God. I'm not comfortable about it, but we receive it. He knew that God did it. You know what he wants in our lives? When the roof caves in, that you're just as content as when the roof did not cave in. When you have a car wreck, you say, this is the will of God, just as much as if I had continued going down the road. If your friends forsake you, or your family leaves you, or your wife or your husband leaves you, or you're, you get sick, this is the scourge of God. Bow to the will of God and be conformed and be like Christ. That's what he wants you to do. Did Christ worry about this thing? He wasn't having fun to it. He said, if it be thy will that this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, thy will be done. And willingly he bowed to it. Now go back over here to Job, the third chapter. I just want to show you this. I love this. I read this to somebody the other night. Glenn, where are we on this? Are we? I guess we've still got plenty of time. Okay, look, look at this down here. Look here in verse, chapter 3 of Job. 
Wherefore is light given to him that is, uh, verse 20, him that is in misery, and life unto the bitter and soul, which long for death, but it cometh not, and dig for it more than for hid treasures. Man is digging for death. He's looking for it. Let me tell you all, my life has been one long, hard trial. Look here at verse 22. Which rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they can find the grave. Now, I'm going to tell you, don't, you, don't begrudge me of leaving here when I get to the grave. It has been a very long, hard trial to this point. And I'm going to tell you when I'm laying on my deathbed, Please don't cry excessively for me when I'm gone because this is what I have been looking for. The believer looks for the grave because he is so persecuted, and the more you're persecuted, you're going to look for it, and it's going to be a blessed rejoicing thing. And Job said it's a place where the wicked cease from troubling and the worry be at rest. There's an old spiritual years ago we used to sing. Every day will be Sunday by and by where the wicked cease from troubling and the weary will be at rest. I'm looking forward to that day, but I wasn't looking forward to it when I was 25. I was still, I was still thinking I was histomy standing. I thought I understood everything about some of my messages and I would say, and I was so proud when I stood for a bunch of Southern Baptist preachers over North Carolina I preached this particular message and but I didn't think I was proud. <laughs> Why is light given to a man whose way is hid? Whom <coughs> God has hedged in. I'm going to talk about that when I come back to talk about that babies don't go to hell. I'm going to come back and talk about this hedged in. I don't have time to talk about it now. For my signs cometh before I eat, and roarings are poured out like waters. For the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come upon me. Now, we wouldn't be afraid and fear it if we were willing to rest in it. Now, Job was truly a wonderful, righteous man of God. He had the only one problem. He had the same problem that we have. He thought he was a good Christian, and there's no such thing as a good Christian. The more you suffer, the more trials you go through, the more difficult he is, the more you bow, and the, the less you know. I have, oh, Clint Greer used to come over here, and he's 70, 71 years old. He sat up there one day, and, and Clint's not a deep scholarly person, but one thing about it, you can't be 70 and not have experience in life. And he sat there and he said, Jim, I don't know anything anymore. <laughs> the older you get, the less you know. <laughs> Isn't that right, Nancy? Don't you know a lot less today than you did when you were 20? I don't hardly know anything anymore. I, I know a few things about the Bible, but what I know about the Bible, I don't know like I need to know them. You see all these words that we study? We really need to study them more because we haven't gotten a hold of this. Have you noticed we're talking about ho'oros and, and, and the word heaven and the word predestinate? We're predestined for the light. That's where the law is, and that's the ho'oros. And horas is the word mountain, and that comes from the word heaven. And all of it is one weaving. It's a fabric, it's what it, let me show you something. I, I gave you part of this, but over in all this is God's weaving in Jeremiah 23, 26 and 3. Look at this, Jeremiah 26 and 3. This is a fabric, Jeremiah 26 and 3. All of this God has woven. <coughs> in the next few weeks, I'm going to cover this really thoroughly. I have needed to preach on this a long time, and I have never heard anybody say why babies don't go to hell. And the Old Testament is full of reasons why they don't go to hell. We don't believe that here at Grace and Truth Ministries. I don't want to preach it, and I don't want it preached up here that babies go to hell. Because they don't. They are innocent. Now, in, in Jeremiah 20, 26 and 3, 26 in verse 3. If so be, well, let's back up a little. Thus saith the Lord, verse 2, Stand in the court of the Lord's house, speak unto all the cities of Judah. This is Jeremiah at the end of Judah's reign, just before Nebuchadnezzar carries them off into captivity, before their idolatrous worship of the sun and the moon, or the Baal Hercules, 
and the grove Venus, the tree goddess, which come to worship in the Lord's house, all the words that I command thee to speak unto them, diminish not a word. Don't you pull any punches, Jeremiah. Tell them 100% everything. Use great plainness of speech. If so be that they will hearken and turn every man from his evil way, that I may repent me of the evil which I purpose. And he didn't mean I'm going to repent and weep and cry. He said the only way repent means to turn. The only way I'll turn from my way is if they repent of their evil. And he says, I'm going to bring evil, which I purpose to do unto them because of the evil of their doings. The word purpose, the word purpose, let me erase me a spot here. The word purpose here is this word, kosob, C-H-A-S-H-A-B, C-H-A. I'm going to have to come back to Sabbath next week. Job needed to rest and so do we. It don't matter what comes, rest in it is what God wants. And if I thought my baby went to hell, I would never rest in it. I'd just weep from now on. Chosab, Kosab, C-H-A-S-H-A-B, C-H-A-S-H-A-B, Kosab. The word Kosab means to plate or to, to plate. We call it plat. When you want a woman plats her hair, she braids it, doesn't she? And when you plat, when you plat, uh, I used to go to Boy Scout camp and we'd plait these little things and they would be those little, you remember those little things we used to make hang around our neck and it'd be a long square, you'd plait them together, different colors, and I can't remember what they were, but we used to make them. <coughs> you got one on key, you got one on key chain. Huh? Called sob, to plate or to, to fabricate or to interpenetrate or to weave a fabric. God is weaving the fabric Hold on a second. He's weaving the fabric of our lives, and this has the same meaning. Weave a fabric. God is bringing all this great tribulation and trials. He's weaving the fabric of our life, and that has the same meaning as Ephesians 2 and 10, for we are his workmanship. The word workmanship is the word poema. P-O-I-E-M-A. Poema, and that word means it means a product or a fabric for we are his workmanship what does that mean that means that he is whipping us into shape by scourging and whipping like he did job for we are his workmanship created in christ jesus unto good works do you do that at first no what causes you to do it the scourge the beating the bloody whipping for we are his workmanship created in christ jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, we, he has predestinated us to conform. We're going to be a fabric that's beautiful to God. It's going to be like a mosaic. Our lives are going to be like a beautiful painting in the eyes of God. That's why we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. We're not just called, we are, but we are the called. Most people, they quote that, quote that wrong. Because the is a definite article, and it modifies the noun called. We are the called according to his purpose. We, he has ordained us as his fabric. We have been predestinated to conform, to be his, to be complete in him. And that word soon means together, comes from morphe. It means to be shaped. And that word morphe comes from the word maros. Christ is our portion to eat of. It means a section or an allotment and that we have been predestined to conform to the law of God and since there's none righteous, not one, there's none that understands and none seeks after God, he has preordained us to this righteousness so why not relax in it? I'm going to stay on this thing called, called the, the spiritual Sabbath for some time to come and that's what Job said he would have been if he'd have died from the womb. He said, I would have been in the Sabbath. He used the same word referring to the Sabbath in the 23rd chapter of Exodus. I would have been in the Sabbath. And that's where we should be. Now, there's a difference. Have, did y'all notice that Job gave God glory, but he didn't rest about it? 
Did y'all notice that? You can actually know the will of God, but what he wants you to do is relax. Now, God has been teaching me to do that. Back in 1986, I bought a brand new town car. I don't buy those, no, those anymore. They're intimidating to people, and I can't afford them anymore because I preach to everybody, and nobody wants to work with me. <laughs> <laughs> I can't buy one. But I had bought a brand new town car, and it was about six months old. It was the fanciest thing I could find. And I was pulling up, and I was pulling up to turn into a, a road. Saw a car coming at me. And the guy wouldn't stop, and I told the lady, I said, he's not stopping. I whipped my wheel to the right, and I hit the gas as hard as I could, and I barely got out in front, barely got pulled away from him, and he hit me on the side and just took the whole side out of the car. And I got out, and I said, and this is one of the first times I can remember really just resting in it. And I, got, I said, and one lady said, oh, are you all right? I said, yeah, look what the Lord did. I remember saying that. I said, look what the Lord did. She said, oh, well, are you all right? Are you okay? You, you seem to be in shock. And I said, I'm fine. Look at that. Ain't that something? Now, if it had been 10 years before, oh, God, my new car, oh, look what you did. What's wrong with you? You're crazy. He was crazy. He was trying to kill himself, and he'd just got out of the hospital. He had about six months to live, and he was trying to kill himself. They took him to the hospital, and he died just a few days later. Yeah? But you see, God picked me out for him to run into. And it was the first time I'd ever treated anything, and I was very calm about it. And I turned around to a guy and I said, uh, can you take me home? That casual about it. Everybody's going, oh, 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 oh. And they thought I was in a state of shock, and I wasn't because God had taught me that's what he's doing. That's what we need to do when the worst happens. You get your arm cut off, say, God wants me to live the rest of my life with uh, one arm. I wonder what it is he's going to do with me. What are the great things he'll have me to do with one arm? Now, that's pretty tough to do, isn't it? See, Job gave God the glory for killing his family, but he wasn't at rest because he said, if I'd have died from my mother's womb, I could have been at rest. But he says, no, I want you to be at rest. Job was just like the rest of us. He was a wonderful, righteous man of God, and he had one flaw. He thought he was histamine. He thought he was already crucifying. And he thought he really knew it all about what he was doing. Job was certainly a righteous man, and I will be the first to hesitate to ever lay any charge against Job because we're all like Job. We'll give most of the people here that believe in predestination, we will give God the credit for the worst things in our life, but we'll worry about it while we're giving him credit, won't we? Right. Now, what he wants us not to do is to be careful for nothing, and that word is the word Mary. I'm not, oh, don't take any thought for this life. I'm really, I'm praying for that every day. That is the rest, the spiritual Sabbath he wants us to enter into. And remember over there in Hebrews 3 and 4? He said, the children of God enter not into Canaan because of unbelief. And he said, even so, you won't enter into the rest of God, believing that, but by believing God, you enter into his rest. What do you believe, believe God for? Everything that happens in your life. Oh, you mean if, if my wife dies? Yes. If my children get killed? Yes. If I get cancer? Yes. If I get a million dollars? Yes. And it all has to be the same. Rest in it. If God's doing it, and he's already got it laid out, and he's got a pre-planned program, why are you and I? We say, well, it's the will of God that, oh, I just don't know if I can take it. Oh, I wish I'd have died when I was born. If I'd have died when I was born, I'd been at rest. What God wants you to do is learn that now. And we're just like Job. Job's not any worse than us, is he? We'll actually hear it from Grace and Truth Ministries. We'll give God credit for what he does. Job gave, God, gave the devil no credit for what God did, but Job still wasn't at rest about it. Well, in the third chapter there, he thought he was upright, but later on he realized what a worm he was. Yeah, he was. That's true. That's true. He realized. He knew that. That's right. He knew that. And I'm, I don't, I'm not going to put Job down at all. I'm saying Job believed in the sovereign will of God. Job believed in the predestination of God, but Job had a hard time resting in it, and God had to take him through that to cause him to rest. Just, I don't know what to say to young people. Just pray God. Level me. Lord, uh, give me all the trials all at one time. Okay. <laughs> well, I made an argument <coughs> about, okay, if babies don't go to hell, then when Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated Esau before he did anything good. He was, he was a vessel. Every one of Satan's vessels 
See, in order to be able to sin, you have to know right from wrong. So all of Satan's children have to grow to an age where they know right from wrong. So God sees to it that they do. They're fitted. Yeah. And in order to be fitted, they have to sin. All of Satan's children will come to an age of understanding sin, and God will never... God, they have to come to that age. And I've used this, I say by the process of mathematical elimination. I'm not trying to say, well, let's use math to solve this. Let's use God's math. The wages of sin is death. That baby can't sin. Sin is transgression of the law. He don't know what the transgression of the law is. It is to know to do good. He doesn't recognize good from evil. It is uh, whatsoever is not a faith is sin. And in the context of that, and I'm going to bring it out, whatsoever is not a faith is sin, is what if there is not a death to self? How can that baby die to self? And some people will say, well, the baby's crying itself. It's, no, it's not. It's like David said. That's the only way it knows to express itself for hunger. Right. Babies don't know how to sin. They don't know how to do right or wrong. How can they go to hell? All of the devil's children have to come to an age. God will see to it that they'll grow to an age. And God predestined him, Esau, to that. That's right. Or, or yeah. Esau, grew up, Esau grew to be a grown man. Yeah, he wasn't going to die. He wasn't going to die until he was grown. Have you couldn't have killed Esau. What does you have of chapter 4 mean? Of chapter 4 what? Go. I don't know. Verse 7 of chapter 4. you got to look at all of it, Mary. You can't look at part of the... Huh? Okay. Can I give you the oh. Let me see here. Then he laughed as the team and I answered and said, If we say to commune with thee, wilt thou be grieved? If we're going to talk to you, about all this? Are you going to be grieved about it? Or are you going to want to be silent is what he's saying. But can, but who can withhold himself from speaking? We've got to talk to you, Job. You're in such a state. You're sitting there in sackcloth and ashes. You're miserable. They were loving him. Yeah, they were. They were. They cared about him. They but they begin to lift themselves up in their pride. Now, God did not allow these men to put some evil words in here. It was their pride, not their evil words. These were good men just like Job. Behold, thou hast instructed many, and thou hast strengthened the weak hands. They said, Job, when men came along, Job said, when I walked out in the street, men stepped out of the way and stood aside and said, there comes Mr. Job. He's the most, one of the most honorable men we ever knew. Thy words have upholden him that was falling. He said, you held up those that were falling, Job. They were, they were talking about what a good man he was, and thou hast strengthened the feeble knees. Those who were feeble, and he said, Job, you upheld them. They said, you were truly a wonderful, righteous man. They were bragging him on, on him. But then they got proud and arrogant, and they started telling him, it was your fault. Something happened to you. You did something specially bad. Not true. God was just purifying. That's all. Yeah. God was... And when you think you're standing, you think you've got it together, you think you're histamine. You think you're crucified. And that's what the Jews said, and that was an old that was an old ancient custom of theirs. And God said, "Not so." And Elihu, the young preacher, waited till they all got through talking, and he said, "I've waited for you, older men, and I've ravished you. Now God has sent me to give you a word from Him." Elihu was the righteous man of God. He was a young preacher in here. Now don't think all you young preacher you got together. Elihu was a special servant of God that he sent to correct this whole situation. He was, Job was the righteous man of this book, but Elihu was certainly the man of God with the message of God to this situation. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to come back, and I'm going to be talking about this. I'm going to be talking about it along the way, and I appreciate Michael for bringing this to my attention because I needed to know these things, so it's kind of challenged me, but there's no way that these babies are going to go to hell. They're innocent. They have to die when they come in. The law is what slays them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for truth and for your word. You're truly a wondrous God. Lord, help us to see and understand this book because, Lord, I know the more I study, I just realize how little I know about what it seems like I've already learned. I don't really know that. Lord, just help us and cause us to bow. We'll give you the praise for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.